Maintenance on drilling equipment. It's time consuming and costly, but it's necessary. And if it isn't done right the first time, it'll have to be done again. In this section, we'll go over the disassembly, repair, and reassembly of the Elmagco brakes. All three models are very similar, and differences can be noted in the manual supplied with the brakes. For our purposes, we'll disassemble a model 6032 and reassemble a 7838. Before you begin your disassembly, be sure that you've figured out what the problem is and that you have the replacement parts. Make sure that the problem isn't in the electrical controls because a lot of these problems are deceiving. Just remember to check them out first if you're not sure that the problem is in the brake. To disassemble the brake, first the bearing cap should be removed. On this 6032, there are six bolts that hold it on. If the inside bearing seal is bad and water has entered the bearing area, you'll probably find rust and water. When this happens, the bearings wear quicker and should probably be replaced. Next, remove the center plate. This old brake hasn't been taken apart in years. Sometimes they just seem to last forever. But the longer they go without being disassembled, the harder they are to get apart. There are two ways to get the center plate off. The best way is to use the back off bolts. First, install two guide bolts into the regular bolt holes opposite of each other. Now, the back off bolts go into the holes that are threaded in the center plate. Insert the four back off bolts in these threaded holes. As you tighten them down, a little at a time on each one, the center plate will back off. Sometimes you won't be able to back the center plate off this way. On a brake that hasn't been disassembled in a long time, you might have to use a knocker to get it off. Clean the threads in the water inlet and screw the knocker into it. A few slams with a hammer and it should let loose. Now, lift it off. Look at how much rust there is in the grease around this bearing. That's because of a bad seal, which will have to be replaced. We'll have to examine it to make sure that the bearings are still good. Now, the bearing's not an easy thing to check. If you feel like there is any possibility that it's going bad, like a rough place when you turn it, chipped rollers or races, or just too loose, have your supervisor inspect it and make a decision as to whether or not it should be replaced. You don't want to have to tear into the brake any more than is absolutely necessary. And replacing a potentially bad bearing now is worth the investment if there's a chance that it might go out soon. If everyone agrees that it's okay, then it should be left alone, unless you need to replace the bearing seal. If you do, the bearing will have to come off to get the seal off. So the bearing will have to be disassembled. This is easy to do and it can be reassembled and reused later. By pulling the bearing race towards you on one side and by using two screwdrivers, you can pluck the rollers out. Be careful not to damage the roller retainers. Lift the outside edge over the bearing ridge with one screwdriver, then push it out with the other one. This should be done backside first, halfway around, then the front halfway. Be sure you place a tarp or some sort of cover in the magnet rotor area of the brake to catch the rollers and all the garbage that will fall into this area. After half of the rollers have been plucked, you should be able to pull the race off and remove the remaining bearings. Then remove the roller retainer. Now heat the inner race. Get it good and hot. This will make it expand and loosen up. Then pop it with a pretty good lick. It'll back right off. Use asbestos gloves to lift it off of the shaft. Then you can remove the rear seal and replace it after the shaft cools. Now check the shaft to make sure that it's still in good condition. If your bearings are okay, but your rear seal is bad,
Be very careful in taking the bearing off. These things cost several hundred dollars, so don't ruin them. If the bearing or seal was your only problem, then go ahead and put the new one on and reassemble the brake. This will be covered in the reassembly procedure later. If you have to remove the magnets or rotor, start by removing the bolts from the outer ring plate. Then knock it free and attach a hoist to it to remove it. You should have a tool that looks like this. If you don't, you can make one out of a one inch steel plate. It's used to lift the magnet and rotor out of the housing. If the brake has been run for a while, it'll be a little difficult to get the magnet out because of buildups of corrosion between it and the rotor. But if you work at it enough, it'll eventually free up. Now, check your magnet assembly. Excessive pitting isn't good. It means that the magnet will have to be repaired or replaced. Bolts with washers should be screwed in here at the lower part of the housing to keep the rotor from backing out while you pull the magnet from the other side. The same procedure for the outboard side is used for the shaft or inboard side. Since the rotor isn't locked down inside the housing anymore, the other magnet might be a little harder to remove, but it will come out. Now the rotor can be worked out. Lift the weights off the rotor with a crane or hoist. Use the same C-shaped tool you've been using. Stick an iron bar in the shaft for leverage and work it out. Keep an outward pull on the rotor as you work it back and forth. Now, check the brake housing for corrosion. Before you reassemble it, it should be cleaned out. Check for signs of wear along the outside edges. Watch for pitting and holes. Any holes will leak. They can be fixed by welding them up. Larger ones might need plates welded over them from the outside. All of these problems should be repaired before reassembling the brake. The brake goes back together just about like it came apart. We're going to reassemble a model 7838. That's the large one. This is a brand new brake, but the procedure is the same as on the other two. Since you'll probably never get a chance to see the inside of the magnet, we'll start with the assembly of it. Each of these assemblies actually has two coils, and each coil is wound with a Dacron glass silicone insulated magnet wire. It's processed through several cycles of dipping and baking. The result is what's called a Class H coil. Next, they're heated by passing electricity through them. This makes them expand so they'll slip inside the coil cavity. When they cool down, they get tight around the inside of the assembly. A sealer is used on the outside lip of the main assembly housing and the inside lip of the assembly cover. When the cover is lowered into position, the two come together and make a watertight seal. Clamps are used to hold the cover tight. There's also an inside seam which has to be sealed, so it's welded all the way around. These two seals keep the cooling water from getting into the coil area and damaging the coils. The only open areas are the breather ports. The assembly of the model 7838 begins with a rotor. First it's slipped into the housing and centered as closely as possible. The outboard end of the shaft should be coated with oil. This will help the spacers slide into place easier. You shouldn't ever have to replace the spacers. The first spacer, the largest one, is heated to make it expand. Then it's slipped into place on the outboard side of the rotor with one smooth, easy motion. The second spacer is the one with a taper. It's heated the same way and slipped over the shaft. This ring is what the inside seal seals against. It should be checked carefully for damage because a nick here will ruin a good seal. Now, before the bearing is put on, don't forget to put the inside seal on, but wait until everything has cooled down because the heat will damage the seal.
make sure that the lip of the seal faces toward the inside of the brake. Check to see that the bearing retainer threads on both the inboard and outboard sides are okay by screwing the nut on. Now, we're about ready to put the bearing on. It's been heated to about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. It slipped on and pushed all the way up against the bushing ring. Now, screw the lock nut into place and tighten it down a little. Sometimes the bearing will try to slide off as it cools, but the lock nut will hold it in place. Well, the outboard side is just about ready. Now, let's do the inboard side. Put the inside seal on. Don't forget that the lip faces the inside of the brake. The seal retainer is heated to about 300 degrees Fahrenheit and slipped on. Now, heat the bearing to 300 degrees. Make sure that you get these things hot enough because if you don't, they'll cool down before you can get them positioned and they'll stick. Heat the bearing retainer at the same time because it'll have to be put on immediately after the bearing. Now, screw the lock nut on and get it snug enough to keep the bearing from moving forward as it cools. Well, now we're ready for the magnets. The first magnet is brought into place. It has to be slipped into the rotor evenly because of the extremely tight fit. After the magnet is in place, line up the holes on the outside of the magnet with those on the housing. Permatex both the housing and the magnet so that there will be a good seal when the outer ring plate is positioned. To help position the outer ring plate, long guide bolts should be screwed into two of the holes. Then the other bolts are screwed in and torqued down. First, to the magnet. Align the holes a little closer. Two starter bolts are screwed into the housing. When the outer ring plate is flat against the housing, the other bolts are screwed in and torqued down. The starter bolts are removed and replaced with regular bolts. Then all of the bolts should be tightened down. Now, the other magnet has to be positioned and bolted into place. It's bolted the same way. Grease both bearings with a good grade of sodium or lithium-based ball and roller bearing grease. Be sure that it's fully packed with grease. Then put Permatex on the inside of the magnet surface and the outside and inside surface of the center plate. Make sure that there's not any dirt in the screw holes of the center plate. Two starter bolts should be screwed into the inner bearing seal retainer to help tighten it down to the center plate and two more in the magnet to help align the center plate. Then position the center plate. Make sure that you have applied sealer to all of the sealing surfaces. Put spacers and nuts on the inside bearing seal starter bolts and begin tightening the center plate onto the bearing. By tightening the center plate to the inner bearing seal first, you can pull it over the bearing easier and straighter. Then, bolt the center plate to the magnet and torque it down. Remove the shaft nut from the shaft and nut spacers from the two starter bolts in the inner bearing seal. Now, install the other magnet, outer ring plate, and center plate to the other side using the same method. After both magnets and center plates have been attached, check to make sure the rotor turns freely. Now, install the bearing cap. Tighten two screws opposite each other first. Check to be sure the rotor still turns freely. If it does, you can tighten the other bearing cap screws and install the shaft nut and lock washer. Now that you know how the brake goes together and how it works, you can see why the maintenance procedures have to be followed.
An overhaul job is hard, costly, and time-consuming. A few extra minutes a day in preventive maintenance and the use of clean water will save you hours in repairs. Okay now, do you remember the maintenance procedures we mentioned in the earlier tape? Well, we'll go back over them anyway. Only clean or treated water should be used to cool the brake. The water level in the brake shouldn't ever reach the bearing. If you run into this problem, it's usually due to restricted return of the water to the storage tank, either because less than three inch pipe is used in the return line, or because the return hole is restricted or clogged. Inlet water temperature should not exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's hotter than this, you should install a heat exchange system to help cool it. Inlet water should flow at 75 gallons a minute for the 5032 and 6032 and 150 gallons a minute for the 7838. Both bearings should be greased every 24 hours or at every trip. You should use a good grade of lithium or sodium-based ball and roller bearing grease like Texaco Marfax, Shell Alvania No. 2, Mobile Mobilux 2 or Exxon Beacon 2. Now, there's a short exam that goes along with this tape that you should take. If you have problems answering the questions, watch the tape again and go over the workbook and your El Magco manual.